is up guys and welcome back to yet again another visualized history and lore video today we are finishing up the epic three-part series of the battle of gettysburg recreated guys oh god the cannonade starting off there it goes that's right boys it is pickett's charge and the cannonade 126 guns for the confederacy 106 guns for the union all firing off against each other from seminary ridge to cemetery ridge and there it goes all down the line guys 126 guns just fired off onto the union and they're gonna return with 106 guns welcome back oh my gosh guys this is one of the coolest things i've ever been able to do ever been able to share with anybody there they go they're firing back see the round balls blasting through here actually going back onto seminary ridge who almost already took out the Fredericksburg Virginia battery we're gonna really quickly pause the game just because we started off really really hot there um actually almost routing the first US battery as well I'm gonna go down the line share with you really quickly <laughs> look the bullets just fl the flying through batteries already broken the first war island is already out of there oh my goodness maybe we need to pause instead of going slow motion um Wow, <laughs> welcome back guys. So, um, we are on Pickett's Charge 1 to 1, recreated, no representation. It is 8th, July 3rd, 1863 over here. It's not 2020 right now, it's 1863. We have recreated all the men that were in the, involved in the, uh, Pickett's Charge 1 to 1. If they had the men there, that's who is here. The, the 8th, 80th Pennsylvania had 184 men try and stop the incoming Confederates on the Cemetery Ridge. The Charlotte, North Carolina Artillery Battery had four guns firing within the cannonade. All right, guys, so just to be clear, there is about 170, 80 guns for the Confederacy firing all across the line. It extends further right down to Little Round Top and left back uh, south of town over there, Culp's Hill. They fire off all across the line. There was an extreme concentration in the center, as you see. The majority of the battery is 126, so there's not a whole lot left. Um, that you're not seeing that was firing off and for the union obviously they had guns everywhere firing off in return so just to be clear uh i'm gonna really quickly go on the line so you can see some of the artillery that's firing off we have i'm actually gonna go back to slow motion we have the charlotte north carolina we have the Al Alber marley virginia i've never i've never said that word before in my life uh the company a sumter battalion battery we have the Letcher, Virginia. We have the Rich, uh, Richmond, Perel. We have the PD, South Carolina. The Johnson, Richmond, Virginia. The Fredericksburg, Virginia. The Warrington, Virginia. The Madison, uh, Mississippi artillery. Oh, who's routing already? Three, four batteries simultaneously route. Oh my gosh. Fauquier, Virginia. We have First Richmond Howies. We have the Georgia Troop, Georgia battery. Ashland, Virginia battery. Virginia battalion battery. The Hampton, Virginia battery. The Richmond Fayette battery oh my gosh second company the washington light uh louisiana artillery the fourth company the washington louisiana artillery the third company the washington louisiana artillery the bath virginia the brooks south carolina the richmond parker oh my goodness madison louisiana bedford virginia troop georgia artillery campbell battery so a little bit different Pulaski, georgia first north carolina artillery first richmond howitzers uh, Campbell battery again a little bit different and then the company C of the Sumter battery forming both the extreme right and the extreme left We're gonna go back to normal speed now. I'm gonna go over here and take care of the Union artillery absolutely crazy guys I've never seen this many guns in Napoleon total war. So in total that would bring us to about 232 guns in total firing off at each other right now So we're doing a really good job of breaking my initial front line of artillery there looks like some concentrated artillery the first new york battery g the sixth main battery f the second connecticut artillery the first pennsylvania light artillery the fifth uh main artillery the first rhode island the 15th in new york the fifth u.s the ninth michigan the first pa as you can see these guys have a lot more organization with their batteries in terms of six guns and all this ordinance four guns all this ordinance it's very nice very clean thank you union uh, fourth U.S. Uh, there, first New York artillery. That's the first New York light artillery. Okay, on this side of the field, already routed off the guns and trying to come back. The Rhode Island Battery B, second core. The first New York light uh, from sixth core is already routed. The fourth U.S. Battery from second core, Battery A. 
the First World Island Battery A and the First US Battery I um, for the Union. I mean, it, and there's some that you still can't see, but I mean, absolutely incredible. So, actually, we do do our artillery duel for quite a while. So, the artillery duel takes place before uh, the, the, the pick is charged historically. Um, the guns, I believe, eventually run out of ammo, uh, but it, they don't stop firing until the Union stops firing their guns. The Union does silence their guns. Uh, it does not mean a contrition or a loss of the cannonade battle. Um, Although they did take a lot of damage in the center, especially with their cannons, uh, what they did have left because they were losing pretty heavily, they uh, they turned off, acting like they got routed off, and saved it because they knew the infantry attack was coming. So you'll see there again, that these guns, even though they may be in good shape uh, or not in good shape, whatever, will stop firing once the infantry goes off. Just to simulate the fact that they ran out of all their ordnance, and the Union um, will turn off their guns as well uh, first, actually, and we'll see them. Um, you know we'll see them um re-limber when the infantry goes off uh just to be clear here so again i never script battles um this is just we have the men that they had we have the ground they they had and we have the situation that they had but we do not have the same tactics necessarily however me personally i really wanted to give homage to what these men did this this day and i went off historical i went off 110 percent historical for the uh, deployment so as it's shown on the official records and the battle maps that's how I deployed them and they all have their numbers so while the artillery duel is going off I'm gonna give it a few seconds and go over the uh, what infantry I can see so by the time it goes off you don't have to go over that and we can just pay attention to the battle because guys it gets wild it gets absolutely wild or we have Brock and Bros Brigade <laughs> looks like some of the artillery over there is taking uh, taking shelter in some uh, barns uh, the 40th Virginia 47th Virginia, 2nd Virginia Battalion, and 55th Virginia uh, from Brockenbro. And we saw these guys before uh, day one, actually. Remember, those guys attacked the uh, Bucktails head on on McPherson's Ridge. We have Davis Green, 11th Mississippi, 55th North Carolina, 42nd Mississippi, and 2nd Mississippi. These guys, hurt, guys got hurt really bad on the railroad cut. So I actually did find the one to one numbers for the Confederacy um, when it comes to Pickett's Charge. I found a really good book and resource that the guy put it together so we know what they took day one and what they had for day three um or took day two and had for day three so awesome 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 i'm very excited to do this i mean it uses never seen a more uber his historically accurate representation of the battle than this um so the 55th north carolina 42nd north carolina as you remember were the heroes of day one for me um mcpherson's ridge able to take that ridge before that entire union corps came up uh, it was the 55th North Carolina member that went in the melee and got all those kills against the 7th Indiana. Trimble's going to be leading the far left flank here, Isaac Trimble. We're going to have the 28th North Carolina on the lane, the 18th North Carolina on the lane, 37th North Carolina on the lane, and the 7th North Carolina all under lane, Pender Division. They're coming up in reserve behind uh, Davis and Pettigrew. Pettigrew has the 11th North Carolina, 47th North Carolina, and 26th North Carolina. As you can see, these guys are no longer 800 and some men. They took a lot, a lot of damage, guys. 11th North Carolina, not as much, but still quite a bit compared to what they had. Remember, they had like 500 some. They're now down to 357 for the charge. Um, so those guys are going to go in first with Lane behind them. To the right of them, um, sorry, 55th North Carolina pedigree, we have Fry's Brigade. So Fry took over for Archer when he got captured and wounded. So this is Archer's Brigade. Remember, they attacked the uh, Iron Brigade in the Peach Orchard in our first video. So the 1st Tennessee, 7th Tennessee, we have the 5th Alabama, 14th in, uh, Tennessee, and 13th Alabama. Behind, uh, between um, Pettigrew and uh, Fry, we have uh, Scales Brigade, which has a 34th North Carolina, 2nd North Carolina, 16th North Carolina, 38th North Carolina, and 13th North Carolina. Now, if you're asking me why I moved these men out to, into the open here, because actually, I was discussing in my last video, Longstreet's one of those guys because he organized the attack. He likes to wait all day to organize, but when he does hit, he hits strong, right? So, he's always been dramatically slow, but always dramatically accurate when he does come through. Um, so, one of the things he had done, especially today, he took especially long. He really did not want to call off the charge. He did not agree with it, um, rightfully so. Um, but regardless, the men made the charge. Um, he actually had some men that were ready to go off early in the day for when the attack was supposed to happen of course the attack did not happen until late in the day um 
because he was just delaying all day as he could. Um, so this is actually, I'm moving him in out here because today is Gettysburg and it's like a hundred and some odd degrees. It is very hot and actually almost a quarter of his men or a good couple thousand at the minimum get heat exhaustion, heat stroke from being out in the sun and not back here in Seminary Ridge in the woods like these other troops here because they're moved out early to get ready for the charge when it's supposed to go off. But then it doesn't go off until hours later so they're sitting in the baking sun forever and so i have that in terms of kemper garnett and armistead here armistead had 30 uh the 30th virginia 57th virginia 53rd virginia and the 14th virginia um behind them in reserve is the 9th virginia right. and kemper uh, garnett here had the 56th virginia the 28th virginia the 18th virginia and 19th virginia with the 8th virginia in reserves uh, on the far right here, we have the 3rd Virginia Kemper, 7th Virginia Kemper, 11th Virginia Kemper, uh, 24th Virginia, and then finally the 1st Virginia. Actually, something cool, I was actually able to visit visit Kemper's grave not too long ago, um, which is pretty cool because it's on private property and we got special permission to go back there. So it was really quite an honor to visit his grave. And he does, on his personal headstone in his family cemetery, he does have the uh, inscription of him fighting at Gettysburg and Pickett's Charge, so that's pretty cool. All right, guys, looking back at the cannonade here, as you see, my front line of cannons obviously took the hardest hit over here. There was quite the concentration, double lines of Union cannons over here, and you see just uh, the field of broken cannons of what I should call this replay. Absolutely disgusting how uh, how deadly and crazy this this artillery duel is. I, again, I've never done anything like this. It was such a pleasure to be able to do this. And again, thank you to my good friend Wolf over on the Discord who was able to organize these battles with me. Um, quite a few of them, actually. He posted for all the battles except Barlow's, so very, very cool on his part. Um, so we play him the day before. I record him the day of and post him the day of, so it's, uh, it's rather a pleasure to do it. So my left flank not hurt nearly as much. My two far left batteries here are actually routed, although the Sumter battery, taking some damage, is still holding very strong. And uh, the battery's duel is starting to come to an end. It looks like Union batteries are still flying off, but it's definitely slowing down. So I think what we're going to see here soon is a uh, is the Union historically stopping their batteries, even though they may still have some working batteries to prepare and uh, save up um, some ordnance for the charge. So looking at the Union lines, we're going to go ahead and go down the Union lines now uh, from left to right. Uh, we have the 8th Ohio, who historically actually was one of the units that came out and flanked Brockenborough over here on the left when Brockenborough came in. Uh, so we have the 8th Ohio 1st Brigade. And this is, a lot of this is 1st first, uh, first and 2nd Corps. So a lot, of, a lot of what forms the Union Center is units that are fighting day 1, day 2. Um, there was no, like... I hear this quite often that Meade predicted that Lee would attack the center, so he reinforced it. Putting all your weakest men, who have all suffered like 40% in horrendous casualties, into the center is not reinforcing your center. Um, it's called just doing what you normally do and putting the weakest in the center and refreshing the flanks, right? Um, as you can see here, you're going to see a lot of refreshed troops. There's no fresh troops here. There's no reinforcements. These same, these same poor guys who are moving here to get a break are going to have to take on Pickett's Charge now. So, But maybe they like that, so they got another chance to fight, right? So the 90th Pennsylvania, the 88th Pennsylvania, and the 8th Ohio. And again, if you want to see these precise numbers, go ahead and pause the video. Uh, 136, 108. I mean, there's just so many men. So you can see some of these guys are actually taking some damage back here. The 126th New York, 11th, 111th New York, 125th New York, and the 12th uh, New Jersey. Wow. Quite a, quite a bit of dudes. Taking some damage back here as well. The 7th West Virginia, the 12th PA, and as you can see, sneaky, sneaky. The Union's starting to, although they are taking some damage, they're starting to conserve their batteries. Uh, so they're not relimbering those guys. They're going to wait until the, the cannon A goes off. The 1st Delaware, the 39th uh, uh, New York, the what was that, 14th Connecticut, 71st Pennsylvania, 72nd Pennsylvania, 69th Pennsylvania, 106th Pennsylvania. So you see a lot of 2nd Corps, 1st Corps, 3rd Corps guys here. Um, we've seen all these guys before, and a lot of the guys on this side as well. Uh, they're fighting each other again for Day 3. 7th Michigan. The 42nd New York, the 20th Massachusetts, the 19th Massachusetts, the 19th Maine, the 15th Maine, um, or is that Mass? These two might, that was Mass, I think. Yeah, 15th Mass, the 82nd New York, and the 80th in New York. Now, there's some more, there's a lot more men on this left flank that are concealed that I cannot see at the moment. Um, 
But then we also have the 114th Pennsylvania and 20, 121st Pennsylvania back here. So remember, these guys actually got hurt pretty bad yesterday, the little route top scenario. And of course, Hancock himself getting wounded in the mix. It wasn't, it was pretty one sided, but it wasn't terribly one sided. Um, and uh, so you're seeing here some pre preludes to that, that damage they're going to be taking. Um, even though they're behind these walls, there's still all those cannons, you know, ringing through. And I think we see a little bit of it on the back side over here. I'm going to go ahead and check just to see if the overhead over here has gotten any of these guys. I don't think so for the moment. I think they're actually pretty safe back here. Historically, because the cannons, I moved my cannons a little further up to have a better shot. Um, they were further back on Seminary Ridge um, than what you see here. And the Confederacy actually took about 300 to 400 losses not just a heat stroke and exhaustion of men passing out and whatever and need, need to go back to the ambulance, but overhead cannon shots that were flying over the batteries and hitting them in the back. Um, so ripping men apart and everybody was ducking behind trees as I'm pretty sure you saw in the movies as well. Um, some, some losses here. Some, you can see some round balls interrupting the lines, a few losses there, one loss there. So not as bad as the Union, but still taking some losses. Um, so yeah, they lose a good portion of their force before they even step off for the battle. And of course, they're supposed to have 15,000 men for the attack, but Longstreet, quite critically, to put it, is well um, criticized because he he kind of defunds the attack before it happens and omits a lot of his own men from participating in the attack. Um, own men from like that were used for little round top he he omits using a lot of those guys for day three uh quite to uh some critics you know i think he was doing it on purpose not to jeopardize the attack but just to say well those men are gonna die but at least i can they kind of save these men which is i guess not the mentality really you want to take um you know if you're gonna do something do it all the way um especially in war you know it's it's uh it's one of those things it's like um what can you do what would you do in the situation i don't know what i would do if i had such a decision to make um you know if you're gonna die at least you know give it your all you know um and uh we'll see how that turns out for these guys here today all right guys we have stepped off and brock and bro leading the way in echelon down the line Thirteen thousand men are on the march across to Cemetery Ridge. Guys, this is in the historical order. This is with the historical numbers. This is the most uber recreation of Gettysburg that I can almost say has almost ever been done, except for maybe the 150th anniversary, but even then they didn't post numbers like this. They didn't have the organization and the scale of this. Kemper going off first, Pickett waiting for him to get ahead of him, and Garnett leading the way as well. Because Kemper, uh, Armistead comes in behind Garnett and Kemper. I mean, I've I've just never done anything like this in my life. I'm I'm so, I'm so amazed I ever got to do something like this and present it to you guys. I mean, it, it's it's an absolute pleasure. Um, I mean that's absolutely incredible actual 13,000 men one to one numbers one to one numbers guys this is this is this is who was here this is how many were there this is not what they did but this is what, what, what it was like oh there it comes woohoo and the artillery starts so guys very historically Brock and bro is getting shot at with round shots so that's very historical Brock and bro is a Brigade commander who is very novice, very um, fresh, and he's leading elites. Well, elites are only as good as, you know, they have to follow orders, they have no choice, no matter if they know better or not. And Brock and Bro does not lead off the attack very well. His lines are jumbled together and mixed up, and it's well, it is well accounted that his lines are actually fixed by round balls flying through the twisted lines and blowing men away. Thus, untwisting his lines because no men are no longer there to twist them. Um, very historically, the round shot is flying in at. Whoa, my God! I mean, I've this is this is it. This is exactly what it was like, guys. I, I don't see how there's 
you could even make a distinction at this point. I mean, this this literally like if I were to teach a history course in high school, I would I would use this when I'm teaching about, you know, the Civil War. I would use this. I would use this as a tool. I mean, there's just there's just nothing like it. They've already lost their officer. The 40th Virginia Brockenborough. So the artillery is not going to be as heavily uh, um, depicted here on the Confederacy as it is in real life. Um, because I was actually very successful in the initial cannonade. Remember, although this is, this is not exactly how it happened. This is what it was like. Oh, man. Blowing lines through these companies. They're almost engaged here. Looking down the line. Look at this. Look how many men are marching off here, guys. Look how many men are marching off. And all the cannons can do is cheer them on and hope them well. Wish them well, essentially. So you see the wide presented attack. I was already I was all the way out to here with my infantry, but when it comes in, Kemper's only going to come up to here. Garnett is actually going to move over to here and pick it behind them. So, it's it, it, like he did in the movie, it's presented a long front, but it's going to come in uh, and culminate in the center. Oh, round shot just wrecking through those lines. Absolutely nasty. But they are almost within range now. They are about to cross the Emmitsburg Road, and they're about to take their first volleys from the uh, 90th Pennsylvania, the 88th Pennsylvania, and the 8th Ohio. How appropriate the first volleys will be fired by Pennsylvanians defending their home. Absolutely beautiful. Oh, actually, it will be the 8th Ohio that gets the first shots on the 11th Mississippi. Oh, and the canisters actually, you just saw that fly overhead. We're a little bit out of effective range, I think, but the canister just fired overhead. I think we're about to see some canister from the uh, first U.S. artillery. And Brockenborough firing off. Who's at the first one? The 47th Virginia is the first one to fire off. 73rd Ohio just appeared over here on the flank, shooting back at the Confederates up there on that ridge. Just to be clear, charge in Civil War terms doesn't always mean literally what it means, charge, like they're going to charge straight into the enemy. Um, a charge can be with musketry fire, nine times out of ten it is. Uh, charge is this, I would describe in the Civil War, they describe it at least, or they, they showed us what, how they think of it, is this is a frontal attack. Um, can Getting very lucky with this canister, missing all over the line here, I don't think they have a very good shot actually. The, the 55th New York, you can see the standard just barely flying above the line. And um, I think they're, yeah, it's weird. The, the canister's actually missing. <laughs> the 55th look at might actually make out of this unscathed on the approach, which is which more than Brockenbrook can say. He's already taken 100 men on the attack. But actually, the 90th Pennsylvania, who's already weakened, is actually taking some damage. Oh, there we go. There goes a company of men right there. There we go, We're crossing the Emmitsburg Road now. They're under defilade now from the guns protecting them. They were very lucky, although it did take a little bit of damage. They are they are not holding well. So with the pressure of the infantry coming up, like many of the batteries did do, they ran. Um, so they fired off the last little bit of canister and they got they got out of dodge. Oh god, slamming through those lines the canister. Absolutely nasty. They're now, they lost 30 men just in the last couple seconds, guys. Give them one, give them one last volley. Come on, do it. Nope. They're going to make it before they can do it. The 55th North Carolina goes in for the charge. Pickett has stepped off as well now. And it's coming up in behind Garnett. And it looks like they're going to be meeting the 7th Michigan, the 42nd New York, the 20th Massachusetts, 19th Massachusetts, 19th Maine, and 15th. Massachusetts. Looks like the 55th North Carolina is ooh, taking some damage from this canister over here. And it looks like suffering a few more casualties. They've actually been able to take these guns without too much trouble. But uh, we are now approaching the angle here. 
Yep, and then historically Davis did break right where he's breaking right now. I remember I put them in in their historical locations. I I didn't script this, but I did want to come off the attack with oh my god with um with their historical deployments. Just trying to do the best I can with what they were given that day to manipulate some sort of victory. So we're gonna try and form up here on this fence now. Uh, see if we can take out some of these guns. Oh my goodness! Ripping through these guys. They've already lost 50 men without ever taking a shot. Let's see if they can form up soon enough. As some of the brave artillery did do, they died on their guns that day, canistering to the last. Some men by themselves. Their whole crew was gone, but they stayed in it and fought. So it looks like, I think the 55th North Carolina, it did route, but it's come back a little bit with the reinforcements from the 42nd uh, Mississippi and the 11th North Carolina of Pettigrew's Brigade, left flank. So they are on the attack here, and they're going to try and go headstrong against the 126th New York, supported by the 12th Pennsylvania here in the back. Some of these guys are i core which is very impressive to see them fighting again. You can see them dropping out there. Oh, that's horrible. So again, very blessed that I was uh, a little more fortunate on the cannonade uh, than they were in real life. Um, there we go, we see Garnett shooting off here. Garnett taking horrendous fire from those fortified walls there. Kemper actually already taking a lot of damage on the canister as well. Oh my goodness. Yeah, not, not looking good for these guys. Looks like the 24th Virginia went ahead and routed. They're going to wheel right here and see if they can get some shots off of these cannons. Answer is, yeah, I think they're going to drive those cannons off. Very good. But the right flank is now compromised. Kemper historically did get flanked on his right. Uh, he didn't meet it with the 11th Virginia and one other Virginia unit, actually. So he wasn't compromised like some other units. He formed well, but uh, he, he did suffer some flanking fire. All along the line, you see just pellets knocking dudes down. Garnett taking a lot more damage though along this line than the, these main boys are holding pretty strong. And he's going to try and move in for a little bit of a closer attack. So those guns here were driven off. Uh, Brockenbro holding strong for now. Uh, the Union reforming on that flank. You hear some rebel yells going off in the 55th North Carolina. They want back into the action. The 44th Mississippi just broke, 42nd Mississippi just broke through the 126th uh, New York. So they're actually starting to break through the Union line. As uh, they didn't break through as hard as this historically, but they, but Armistead did. Armistead definitely did break through pretty hard, uh, but then was met by strong wave reinforcements that finished it off. Oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! Fresh volley into these guys. They're gonna give it, give it right back. Give it right back. Yeah, they give it right back. Not as much though. Four second Mississippi taking even more damage than they did the first day. Oh my goodness. Looks like we got the... Is this Fry? Yep. Those Tennessee boys who fought the Iron Brigade and suffered heavy losses day one are going to try and take on uh, the 14th Connecticut. First uh, First Delaware actually is already in combat. It looks with the 26th North Carolina who was part of Pettigrew's Brigade. And Pettigrew's Brigade actually made it the furthest out of all the units. I think just because of the geographical, you know disposition of the attack, although Armistead did, I think, did better than them in the attack, um, in terms of performance-wise, they were just geographically further, so that's the official high watermark where the Pettigrew's Brigade is. So Garnett is completely shattered on this line, they, I don't even think they made it to the to the uh, main boys over here, and the Massachusetts boys who are still holding strong, um, some, some of them reforming, but a lot of them routing behind Pickett, who are going to try and come back in for another go at it. 24 Virginia came back while the 11th routed, and it looks like the 1st had routed as well, so Kemper is just not breaking through these lines. Um, these lines are very strong. They have such a formidable position. And Pickett now going into action. So actually we see Fry's Brigade, Alabamians, the second line of them, the reserve line. The first line is already broken, uh, going in for the attack. And it looks like the fighters are breaking through pretty heavily back here. The 55th North Carolina and 42nd Mississippi, as they did day one are being my headliners on day, uh, day three as well. The 42nd Mississippi are gonna try and go off against the 7th West Virginia here. And I think uh, I think the 55th North Carolina is actually going for these guns here in the back. 
I'm gonna see if they can take the uh, under uh, oh, sorry the first New York light battery back there that's uh, causing trouble for Brock and Bro here. Looks like actually one of Davis's brigade, the 11th Mississippi, has actually broken off to support and is still supporting Brock and Bro's brigade, who's almost completely broken now. But I think they're gonna reform. So finally, that the initial attack has come and they've pretty much traded almost. Uh, the reserve lines, and this is why you go deep like this. You have reserve lines. Lane's Brigade, who I told you was coming in behind um, behind Davis and Brockenbro, are here. And then um, Scales, who is behind uh, Fry and uh, Pettigrew, are here as well. If we looked on the line here, it looks like Armistead is going off. This is Armistead's charge coming in here, guys. And Kemper's suffering pretty heavily over there on the right, trying to hold this together for Armistead to come through. Here it comes. Here's Armin says charge. Give him the cold steel, boys. Oh, some last minute volleys off onto him. And we have the first general down for the day. And it is it is Hancock. Hancock is either wounded or killed back here by the 42nd Mississippi. What chats, dude? That 42nd Mississippi just jumping from one melee to the other, charging the 125th New York now. Some rally union men are not going to be able to save this battery who are countercharging very heroically into these uh, those 55th North Carolinians. It looks like a lot of pedigree was broken here on this front. Uh, I think this is another pedigree right here. So the last of the pedigree is trying to charge through the union falling back to a reserve stone wall. And Armistead's attack is on full swing and Armistead breaking through pretty heavy, heavily actually. And Garnett reforming to form that right flank to try and support uh, Armistead trying to break through. And... The 57th is the first to break through. They're the first to do it. 53rd suffering just due to the attack, but the 20th main, a lot of these guys are suffering even heavier. Yeah, there they go. Maybe the 106th Pennsylvania can form that line. Yeah, I'm just breaking through pretty heavily at this point, as they did historically. They broke that first line pretty well. The second line, yelling them to get behind us, get behind us. Oh, they're gonna. Oh, are they. No. What are they doing? What are they doing? What are you doing? Cowards, all of you. Cowards. Who's routed over here? So it looks like the 42nd Mississippi is finally routed due to inflated fire from the 12th in New Jersey, but not before taking the 125th New York with them. And the 55th North Carolina has completely broken through into the rear. Completely. It's not even. There's no resistance anymore. So the Union line center is completely broken at the moment. And uh, so this attack is going 10 times better than what it did in real life, probably due to communications being a lot better in organization and all that sort of stuff. So Garnett giving it another go. Garnett breaking into these lines here, trying to break the Union on the hundred, the Bucktails, actually. The Bucktails from day one in the first Minnesota are gonna try and hold song strong. As you see, they suffered one of the highest casualty rates of the war. Um, Day one. And Harrow, Harrow of 11th Corps is now down. Harrow himself. So Hancock and Harrow have both given their life to try and hold this line together. Garnett's suffering a little bit on that line, but he's giving it to him as best he can. Armistead reforming for the attack. They had to take a break there to reform, but they are reforming pretty heavily. And it looks like Scales is falling behind, so Armistead leading the way here, the deepest into the lines at the moment, other than the uh, 55th North Carolina, um, which North Carolinians do make it the furthest. They do set the high water mark. Come on, give it to him. Give it to him. Come on. Oh my goodness. You see lines of men going. They just lost their color bearer there. Oh, what a good charge. And the 57th. Whoa, what a charge. They pushed right through them. They just, oh my god, they melted through those lines. What a charge. They went full sprint into them. Absolutely incredible. So actually, Armistead's right flank is now uh, compromised with uh, Garnett being um, being broken, actually, on the flank there. Kemper desperately trying to hold on to what he has to give Armistead that window. And Scales is coming up and you see some of the initial men that were broken trying to reform behind scales and lane where they reserve um brigades that came up behind them they took the damage so that scales and you know scales and lane could break through they essentially 
they essentially wear the nail nail heads and and uh, scales and lane where the hammer. It looks like some of Armistead is actually breaking. The 38th Virginia just broke, although that 50 that 57 hit that thing so hard, dude. I've never seen such a, like a breakthrough charge like that. I mean, it was just like they phased through the line there in those Pennsylvanians. And the 22nd North Carolina and 16th North Carolina, fresh under scales, are going to try and break through here on the uh, 123rd New York, who was holding strong. The so scales all along the line is actually really helping out and lane as well. You see these reserves coming through and actually they love Mississippi and Brock and bro have, have been continually breaking. Trimble himself has been trying to rally them back. And they've been doing it pretty successfully. You see here Rebel Yell going off there. Who's charging this time? Got a Rebel Yell going off back there. So the 34th North Carolina winning pretty heavily. So that you see the reserves funneling from the right flank. Um, trying to come over here to help out. The 57th Virginia is going to go in for it again, but they're getting shot in the rear as well from the 106th Pennsylvania. I'm not sure if they're going to be able to do it. The 114th Pennsylvania that suffered so heavily earlier, uh, ye yesterday actually from Kershaw's brigade and Anderson's brigade. Uh, they did not fare well against South Carolinians and Georgians. Let's see how they do against Virginians. Uh, I think they're going to lose there again. Man, they just they have not had a good time. Man, 57th Virginia, really just wrecking into him. Who's just firing off here? The 99th Pennsylvania forming a good line. Scales broke that 123rd in New York, and now taking a lot of volleys. Trying to reform their lines, all in uh, confusion here. They're all twisted up here. Trying to break back through. The 71st Pennsylvania taking some deadly fire from the 34th in New York. In the second Mississippi, look at these tiny little guys. Why would they make them fight again on this day? Same thing with the 26th North Carolina. They started with 800 and only have 200 some left. And you're going to make them charge again? Absolutely crazy. So the 55th North Carolina actually holding back here. I mean, it's broken through. So the Union is actually trying to compromise and try and find a way to... Uh, oh, the 11th Mississippi charged in against the uh, 136th New York. They were tired of shooting all day. Yeah, almost 100 casualties already for this 11th Mississippi. I think they're going to break on that. Who broke here? 55th Evans, Virginia finally broke, but not before breaking that uh, 114th Pennsylvania. Poor guys. The 4th Main of Reserve Line was actually able to hold it together. Scales knocked down into that line, traded on the left, and I do not think they're going to trade on the left, right here. 16th North Carolina is too, uh, too beat up. You can see some of the Tennessee from Fry's actually reforming from where they initially broke. And Pettigrew has reformed and are ready to go back in. So the left is looking fantastic for the Confederacy. Uh, the right, not so much. Armistead, a little bit of Armistead's Virginians have reformed here along with a little bit of O'Neill. Um, they're trying to go back in. It looks like the 9th Virginia just broke on the, uh, on the 116th Pennsylvania. Fifty seventh Virginia taking some casualties on the way out. This poor little this poor little thirteenth Alabama is trying to go back in. Give it to me guys. Give it to me little guys. Come on, it's so cute. Ugh, they just barely hit the lines before they collapse. And the thirty eighth Virginia hitting this as well, but they've just taken so much damage along this line. As you can see here, look at the carnage. The absolute carnage all along this line, Union and Confederate. Absolutely horrendous. The Confederate center broken pretty heavily. The reserve lines did work, and um, they're rallying whatever men they have left. Uh, those reserve uh, brigades from the Confederacy are actually starting to dwindle in numbers and reinforcements. Looks like Scales 34th Virginia and 11th North Carolina actually from Pettigrews who broke the Iron Brigade. Day one are going back in for it. Who, who attacked the, oh, Fry, Archer's men. Coming back in here, performing well in the attack. But as you see now, now the 52nd, oh, sorry, the yeah, 52nd New York and the 116th Pennsylvania are gonna start shooting infiladed into this attack here. And General Pickett is pushed off the field. He is, he is not, he's not dead or wounded himself, but he has to relieve the field due to um, attrition losses from his general staff. 
Pedigree going back in for it. Going to try and take on. It looks like the fourth main. And the 52nd North Carolina coming in behind them. Not too far. This is absolutely incredible, guys. One to one numbers. I mean, this is, this is ridiculous. I mean, seeing what the fields of bodies probably actually looked like is just. We can't do it anywhere else. Look at them just smacking these lines. Just getting shot rank and file down the line. This poor 47 North Carolinians broken already. As they're getting outflanked. The 52nd North Carolina breaking as well. Trading with the 19th Maine and I think, yep, and the 19th Massachusetts. So barely holding this together, but those reserves coming in, I think, will actually do the trick. Some routed scales actually on their way back into the fight. Those 38s that we saw earlier are actually coming back. 26 North Carolina itself going back into the breach. Some some of those Union boys have reformed and tried to retake this out here in the way back. Actually, that second Mississippi in the uh, in the 55th North Carolina from day one. Actually, man, the 55th North Carolina is my hero day two again. I mean, day three again. Just absolutely wrecking through these lines. And look at these, look at these tiny little guys. Second Mississippi actually doing a lot of damage for only being 90 dudes. So they're going to try to reform here on the far right, being held together by Harrow, Staff, or what's left of it at least. Looks like the 33rd North Carolina in their lane. One of those reserve brigades are going back in. Rock and Bro still reforming and attacking. They have not broken through their initial attack point. Uh, being poorly led in the video game as they were in real life, apparently. Pettigrew himself is on the front lines, and he, his general staff has already suffered horrendous casualties. And not looking good here. The Union was just barely able to reform in time. The 55th Carolina giving it another charge. Into the third main this time, being supported by their little 90 second Mississippians. Took you. But they're going to be reinforced by the 64th New York, 53rd Pennsylvania. Look at these guys, these are all fresh. And some Vermont guys as well. Looks like those scales reinforcements were broken yet again along the lines, and uh, Pettigrew is going to try and rally some of these Davis. Man, Davis, 42nd Mississippi is back already. And they're approaching 50% casualties. 7th North Carolina Lane is back as well. You see, they're all exhausted, very tired. Well, these two are fresh, but this guy's very tired. You can tell it's not going to turn out very well. Oh, the f oh, my heroes, the 55th North Carolina has broken along with the 42nd Mississippi along those reserve lines. Good job, Harrow, for rallying that. Well, who's charging over here? The first Tennessee back at it again. Fry has reformed several times and charged in again. That, that seems to be Fry's thing. They charge in and break right before they hit the lines. That's That seems to be their trademark, apparently. Look like Lane forming up to fire some hot lead into those kids. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. All this right here is one volley. Four bucktails. Honestly, they kind of deserve it. Day one, they really... I'm still salty about day one. These guys really hurt me day one. Hurt my feelings pretty hard. I just could not break through him. Brock and Bro could not break through him. That that seems to be Brock and Bro's thing. Speaking about things, Brock and Bro can't seem to break through anybody. They will fight out all day until the last man, reforming till the end, and no matter how many times they break, coming back and dying along the line and trading pretty well. But these cannot seem to break through. They don't have like the initiative to get through, you know? The 7th North Carolina forming the line, 42nd Mississippi forming the line, and it looks like the 11th North Carolina going in for a charge here on the far right on the 52nd New York. I don't know, they also hit the 116th Pennsylvania, so that's going to chart. Yeah, they're going to, I think they're going to attack in the flank. Yeah, attack in the rear now. That's, that's, that's going to cause them to route. That's it right there. Because that attack in the rear uh, debuff they got from hitting that as well. So I think they actually would have broken the 52nd New York there. The Union actually reforming along these lines. Those initial lines have actually been broken. So good job by Lane, uh, forming a pretty good fire line here. But they're going to get starting. They're going to start getting hit, infiltrated, and one unit left. 
There's one unit left. I'm trying to take out the 136 New York. Oh my gosh. Rock and bro. If you don't if you don't do that, shameful display. Shameful display. Kemper still along the line. Speaking of people who can't break through, Kemper is having his, a lot of trouble as well. There was still a heavy concentration of batteries over here on the far right that stopped Kemper from being able to actually break through. So uh, that line is held pretty strong there. Still quite a good little garrison of Union troops there. But the 8th North Carolina scales are back from their horrendous charge earlier. And um, 42nd Mississippi, oh my gosh, not holding very well. I believe the 116th Pennsylvania is actually bucking ball. So... I believe, yeah, they have Buck and Ball. So they're actually dying along the Buck and Ball line. Poor guys. The 18th North Carolina broken. And the 33rd North Carolina lane. Lane seems to be the one who's uh, the reserve brigade. He seems to be forming the strongest line here at the end. Has made it the furthest here at the end. So yeah, this looks like to be the it. That looks, this looks like to be it. This is Pickett Charge, guys. So I think... Just holding quite the breakthrough they made here. Um, with this being the angle right here and this being the clump of trees I, I, right here. These are the clump of trees that they're supposed to hone in on. And um, they did very well. I mean, they did very well for day three, but I think this is a wrap. I mean, com completely shattered the center of the Union. The Union line was completely broken in two here for a good couple hours during these fightings. During this fighting. Um, yeah, so this Davis came back. My heroes, the 55th North Carolina, but they are exhausted. So even if they do come back, it's I'm not sure what they can do. Yeah, that does seem to be the the, the thing here. Whoever is coming back is just too exhausted to actually put up a fight. It looks like Isaac Trimble has shifted from the right to help Pettigrew hold this line together. And I think they broke the 33rd New York over there. Well, broke it and then they came back. So poor guys. So at least they, they at least they did some work. Actually, the 33rd New York in the back from Lane also doing some really good work. Lane is just, Lane's posted up, dude. This is all Lane's brigade right now, except for a little bit of Davis here that has reformed. Breaking the Union line pretty heavily, actually. Looks pretty broken. Cadwell is, like, I think the last general alive right now. Ugh. Can you chill out for two seconds? Give you guys a break from casualties. Well, who knows? If I can break this Union line, it may be actually... I could do it. I think this bucking ball is just really screwing me right now, though. I think that bucking ball is what's doing now. I don't, I don't think I knew they were bucking ball. Second core. Is this Irish? Maybe the Irish Brigade. Yeah, they're Irish Brigade. The Irish Brigade actually, I think, kind of saving the day right now. As they did pretty historically. Yeah, I think the Irish Brigade is what really hurt me right here, which kind of... Oh, is that Cadwell as well? Cadwell's gone. I think all the Union generals have either got wounded or killed today. So yeah, although they have quite a bit of small reserves back here, Emperor's still pretty strong right now. So I think if I would have broken them right here on the right flank, I would have been able to see. I'm actually breaking through again on the left flank because of that unit. I think I would have had this, actually. I think I would have had this. I think it was that close. I think it came down to what happened right here. And uh, I think this uh, 116th Pennsylvania, who you can see it chevroned out the wazoo. Um is actually saving the day. I think that bucking ball is actually saving the day for the Union here. You see, all along this line, this line is flimsy, coming in piecemeal. And the lane here is still pretty strong, and this unit back here is very strong as well, so... Looks like, actually, even this 14th Vermont, who's a big unit, is having pressure. So I think if that 116th Pennsylvania wasn't there, I think that would have been... I think that would have been Confederate victory here, guys. I think that's how close it came, right there. Going back and looking at this, I think that was it. That was the deciding factor. Yep. Oh, Brock and Bro, everybody. Clap for Brock and Bro. It was a hard fight. All your buddies are dead, but at least 121, 120 out of the, like, 1,300 men uh, finally made it through. Whatever victory you call that. Yeah, it's just a wrap now. That, wow, I think it was really this. Look. Yeah, the 52nd New York broke all those uh, exhausted units, and then the 106th Pennsylvania at the bucking ball whittled down the last of Lane's men on the right flank. So, impressive. Impressive work. Couldn't come soon enough because 
for a second there. Usually by this time, if an army falls back, if they're broken this hard in the center. But uh, I guess these Union boys are a little, a little stubborn, huh? Really impressive all in the game. What a, what a beautiful, beautiful charge. I mean, look at the bodies, guys. Look at the cannons. Look at all of it. Isaac Trimble over here with, back with the Rock and Bro Brigade. I mean, absolutely ridiculous. There's not a spot on this field that isn't covered in bodies. Look at the line here. Look at that line. Look at all these bodies. Look at this right here. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. That's Pickett right there. Look at that trade. Look at that trade. One for one kills just like coming back on each other. Kemper's still going at it, but you can see here. Garnett died along this line, but you see how broken these guys are. So Garnett and Kemper almost broke through over here as well. So all along the line was very compromised for the Union. And Kemper going back in it against the uh, 16th Vermont here. He's actually not fair. Maybe maybe Kemper's gonna break through on the right. Maybe Kemper's gonna be the. Maybe Kemper can bring it back. All right, guys. With the last little bit of daylight we have left, Kemper reformed the Third Virginia and the Seventh Virginia. Is actually about to break the 13th Vermont there. Remember, the 16th is already routed and gone. And I think. Yeah, we don't got much time left. Only a minute left. But they're doing some good damage. They might actually end up breaking this right flank here in the last couple seconds. Yep, there it goes. All that holds is 98 um, Pennsylvanians on this extreme left. The Vermont boys have broke upon the Virginians. Oh yeah, pretty good casualties coming in here against the Pennsylvanians. Such a thin line. These guys at first four took so much damage day one. Black bear goes down. Is that Vermont coming back? I think they came back. Oh, Pennsylvania broke. <laughs> Kemper actually ends up breaking the line at the last couple seconds. You should have done it freaking 20 minutes earlier when uh, Armistead needed you. Beat up a little bit here. Only got a few seconds left. I don't even think they can get the volley off in time. Nope, not even time. All right, boys, that was Pickett's Charge. Thank you so much for sticking through this with me, guys. Uh, the, the amount of support you guys have shown on these videos is absolutely incredible. Um, and it should get support. What these men did uh, these past three days in 1863 was absolutely incredible. Uh, some of the greatest military action the U.S. has seen still to this day. Um... You know, on both sides, it's absolutely, absolutely unfeasible, um, and um, incredible. So let's go ahead and look at the uh, deployed here: thirteen thousand for the Confederates, eleven thousand for the Union. Uh, losses are about six thousand for the Confederacy, about five thousand for the Union. Uh, Forty, about almost five thousand uh, casualties uh, inflicted. For the uh, for the um, for the Confederacy and f almost six thousand inflicted for against the Confederacy. So look here, actually, <laughs> as they were day one, here they are again, in their exact in the exact order: fifty fifth North Carolina, number one; forty second uh, Mississippi, number two. My boys, my boys. I love the twenty sixth North Carolina, but tsh, these guys performed, performed incredible absolutely incredible with uh brock and bro actually you have a brock and bro up there where is that where, where was i saw that it was like in the top 15 one of them was the 55th virginia there at the end it's actually gonna break into like the top 15 wow brock and bro you gotta be joking who did the worst here who we have on the smallest the 28th North Carolina lane did the worst zero kills eighth virginia zero kills 13th North Carolina, two kills. But these guys only deployed like really small numbers, as you can see. So, 7th Tennessee actually did very bad. Look at that. Deployed 287, lost 77, only killed 19. So, but they lost a lot day one. You don't expect them to hold day two. How did 26th North Carolina do? Where was that at? 26th North Carolina deployed 255, lost 108. Guys. Guys. They only have a hundred and some men left coming here with almost 
Eight and a half. 850 men, guys. Wow. Killed 74. Okay, guys, thank you so much for participating in this. Um, You know, a lot's going on in the country right now with uh, statues, uh, both Union and Confederate. Lincoln, uh, Grant, the 50, uh, the 54th Massachusetts Monument being all vandalized. Um, I was, you know, I'm glad I was able to do this. Uh, it's, it's, I do this first and foremost as a teaching tool. I play historical games so I can see what it was like for those men so I can better understand those men um, on both sides, what they went through, who they were, and what it was like for them, what they, you know, what they had to experience. And, um, you know, a lot going on in the country. I think it's cool that we can do these sort of things right now. A lot of people are coming around these videos and liking them. And, uh, you know, don't be afraid to learn history that may be a little, uh, a little uncomfortable to learn. Because you see here we have thousands dead on the field. Your ancestor may have died here today. Uh, but th don't shy away from that sort of stuff. Uh, embrace it full forward. Uh, learn it. Memorize it. Enjoy it. Enjoy history uh, for what it is. What it was. Um, and learn from it especially. So um, on that note, guys, I'm going to head out. Thank you all for participating in this. I hope you all enjoyed it. And make sure to like, comment, subscribe, share. Share it.